Okay, we're ready, you guys. I was talking to the sound sound roof. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Off day, good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. This informational briefing by the Committee on Housing, Utilities, Public Safety, and Homeland Security is now called to order. It is now 1540. Uh, my apologies for starting a little late. For the record and in accordance with 5 GCA Chapter 8, Subsection 8107, notices were sent out via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on May 12, 2017. Second notice on May 16, 2017. With me today is Senator Will Castro. Senator, thank you for being here. The purpose of this informational briefing is to help the committee and the general public understand issues regarding customs and quarantine, agency personnel overtime budget requests, and service update fees. Today we have uh, Major Merfallen, uh, Major Perez, and Mr. Diaz from Customs and Quarantine. I'd also like to call up Major Tyron. Will you be giving oral testimony? No? Oh. Okay, okay. Um, is there anyone else that will be giving oral testimony? Where's the director? Good afternoon, uh, Senator Nelson. Director McDonald uh, expresses his uh, apology for not being here this afternoon. Um, today they had a Typhoon Part 2 exercise, tabletop exercise at the uh, Sheraton Hotel, mm. and he was required to be physically there for mm. the entire training. But on behalf of Director McDonald, you have myself, Major yeah. Vincent Paris and our Administrative Ser Service Officer, Mr. Diaz. Thank you, Major. Uh, you know, I just want to share that we've met numerous times, um, and, you know, I even paid a site visit over, and, and the reason of this informational briefing is there's a lot of concern about you having to maintain your operations and also the uh, your lingering cost of rent um, that you have to pay towards the airport. Uh, secondly, uh, the personnel and man, man, personnel and man structure needed to so that you can do your operations a lot more smoother. Um, and so we're here to talk about that today. But I also wanted to to state for the record that uh, I've had some people call from from uh, customs and quarantine, and they were stating that. Um, they were not allowed to give testimony during informational hearings. Now, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm bringing this up so that you know that uh, that this is, you know, they're reaching out and and they'd like to, you know, have the opportunity to speak and have the floor uh, and have the opportunity to speak in front of the body. And I want to make it clear that I am very open to that. Uh, and I, and uh, just to dispel any concerns that this informational hearing uh, is available for anybody that would like to give testimony as well. Thank you for informing me about that, uh, Senator. That's the first I heard of that. I know that our agency did not discourage or prevent any of its employees, both civilian and uh, uniform officers, not to attend this informational brief. You do know that Major Vincent Paris was here earlier for the informational briefing regarding the post committee. I know for a fact that Major Vince extended the invitation and also notification of the informational briefing that was going to be conducted for the post. And if, if it was true that we were trying to prevent our officers from attending this testimony, why would Major Vincent Paris put that out to the email to all employees? So just for a point of clarification, unless it's on a one-to-one -one with somebody they're talking to, but I do know for a fact that management is not preventing any of its employees to air out whatever, whatever uh, uh, personal opinion that they may have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Major, for um, clarifying that. It's, it's important that we give everyone an opportunity to speak uh, their concerns within the agency. I understand we are law enforcement agencies, we have chain of command, but um, my door is always open for anyone because it is my duty to serve the people. Thank you. So I know you have a presentation that you'd like to present for the briefing today, is that correct? Yes, yes. the presentation will be uh, provided by Major Vincent Paris. Okay. And, sir, 
whenever you're ready. Uh, I'm ready whenever you're ready. Okay, um, this is, if you're looking at the screen, what, what you see is a presentation that I had provided to members of the Oceana Customs Organization uh, during our conference uh, couple, several weeks ago. And although it may not speak to many of the issues that we have, there are many important issues that we did identify. So uh, I will not read uh, verbatim, but I will go over some of the important parts. Next slide. When you look at this first slide, it basically talks about um, uh, you, you won't really know where you're going un until you know where you've been. And so with that as a, a, uh, a starting point, um, we need to understand our history of where we were uh, in order to understand where we are at right now and in order to understand where we want to go. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so basically what you see is that it talks about the location of Guam as it relates uh, to the Pacific and the importance really strategically of where we lie and, and how we are relied upon as, uh, as a military asset. And so with that being said, we really have to take a look at our borders and to ensure the, the, the utmost protection for our people, our island, and our resources. Next slide. Uh, basically, what you see there is just a, a little bit of a, a, a reference to the Marianas Lati Stones, and it talks about uh, in order to have a good structure, it starts with a foundation. And because the Lati Stone is representative of our culture, I wanted to put it out there to the rest of the Oceana members so that they have an idea of, of, uh, of some of the aspects of our people. Next slide. One more. Okay, so pretty much this is our mission in a nutshell. Our, our, our mission statement is actually very lengthy, but our mission, when you read it, is to facilitate trade and commerce and provide overall border protection. And so when you take a look at that in its simplest forms, you're gonna find that there's so many things that we do as an entity regarding the protection of our borders, and a lot of it has to do with collaboration. And uh, many people are under the misconception or, or perception that uh, we are part of the federal government as it relates to customs uh, and border protection, but we're not. We enforce federal and local laws governing customs, agriculture, public health, and we also apply taxes at the border, and we maintain vigilance in order to protect our people, our island, and our resources. Next slide. Keep going until you see 1969. Okay, so pretty much what you're gonna see here is, is a, a snapshot of our history as it relates to Guam. And um, for many of us, we understand this. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that the members from the OCO were aware that you know we, are, uh, we, we have diversity in our population, we have diversity in our leadership and governance, and diversity in our culture. We've been where we've been uh, a melting pot, so to speak, and uh, at some point we have to grow and move forward. Next slide. Okay, so for those of you who can't really read the the, the topic, it basically gives you a snapshot of Guam customs. So pretty much in 1952, we were created and we were called the Port Security Division. And then in 1971, we were redesignated as the Customs and Quarantine Division. So we were under the Department of Commerce for uh, a few years until 1994, through public law, we were separated to, be, to become the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency. And a few years after that, in 2003, we assimilated the plant protection and quarantine functions into the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency arsenal so that we can become force multipliers to help uh, protect the island and its resources. Next slide. Okay, so the significance of Guam. Uh, pretty much, 
I mentioned it earlier that we are strategically crucial as the closest U.S. soil to Asian areas of interest. And in today's uh, news, you hear about uh, the threats towards Guam and the United States from North Korea. And so pretty much our location allows us for the most expedited uh, 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 launching of resources. So one of the things that we have to look at is the protection of our resources. And with Guam Customs, uh, if we are able to, to receive that, we would be the chokehold or the choke point for uh, many of the things that actually you see that uh, makes it into the economy. Uh, there are two pictures up there. Uh, the first picture is a picture of uh, the detector dog unit and the special enforcement guys from Guam Customs, along with uh, former Governor Gutierrez and uh, detector dog trainer Rob Daniels from the Australian Customs Service, uh, and they were helping to build Guam Customs in their capacity. Uh, to uh, help create uh, more of a resources uh, resource with detector dogs. So we got assistance through the Australian Customs Service. And the reason why, or how we happened to get that was, many years ago, one of our former uh, chiefs uh, ended up going to an OCO type conference uh, and networked. And they said, we'll give you dogs if you send the guys. And that's pretty much what happened. The picture that you see below that is a picture that was taken in 1998. I think there you may have either our first and second cycle together, uh, and uh, th that was like the start of the time when we had a lot of resources at the border and were able to do much more inspections and uh, uh, utilize our resources much more effectively in many different areas. Next slide. <coughs> This slide basically just talks about capacity building, and I mentioned it in my previous slide. Um, Australia, France, New Zealand, and through the Oceania Customs Organization and the World Customs Organization and other organizations of similar nature, they help their member uh, charges uh, with capacity building, and that could be providing education, training, or resources. Uh, in some respects, we're left out because many people are under the impression that Guam Customs is already tied in directly with federal funding, federal equipment, supplies, you name it. But if you really take a look at our core, um, and I'll get into that in a couple slides, that uh, we are operating pretty much on our own with our own devices. And then on the third paragraph, it talks about Asakura World, Pacer Plus, PC Trade. These are information technology platforms that are being utilized in the Pacific. Uh, keep in mind that Guam Customs is very paper intensive and we do not have the current uh, information technology platform to be able to implement that. Next slide. Okay, so this is just a snapshot of what we do. We collaborate and enforce on behalf of both the federal government and the government of Guam. And so I'm just gonna read a few, uh, like the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the ATF, uh, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Department of Transportation, uh, NOAA, the US Postal Service, Centers for Disease Control, and then you've got the local side, uh, Public Health and Social Services, Revenue and Tax, Department of Agriculture, the Police Department, GBB, statistics and plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we are doing is we're enforcing both federal and local uh, uh, policies, regulations, and laws, but we're doing it at the local dime. Next slide. Uh, click again. One more time. Okay, so what you see here is basically a snapshot of Guam and the five ports of entry. We have five ports of entry, in case you didn't know. We have, of course, our main international airport, which is operated on a 24-7 period, uh, run on three to four shifts. And then we also have uh, officers assigned to the Anderson Air Force Base uh, for the flights that come in there. And then we have officers who maintain an office over at the Guam Main Postal Facility. We take care of the marinas, and we also take care of the freight and the 
vessels coming in and the passengers who arrive at the Port Authority. Next slide. This is a snapshot of our customs officer um, resources. Uh, in 2000, we had approximately 230 customs officers, and um, yes, right now it's just 2017, we have 114, but I have to make a correction because as of today, we lost two in the last uh, maybe couple weeks. One is retiring, and another person left to join a, one of, uh, a federal job. So these are the things that we have to contend with. There's no retention or incentive for officers. Once they get trained, they can leave us and pretty much that leaves us in a bind of having to train people, which takes anywhere from a year to two years. And then prior to that, you have the bureau, bureaucratic uh, processes that kind of delay um, by applying, reviewing, stratifying, and then interviewing and all that. Next slide. Okay, so this is a snapshot of our organizational chart. So pretty much there are uh, four divisions. So you have the inspection and control division that in comprises all the officers who are assigned at the ports of entry who maintain the actual vigilance. Then you have the uh, logistics and support division that takes care of the training, the property, evidence, storage, uh, they conduct research and development. They, they are trying to uh, move the platform of management information uh, and the technology forward and also conduct a, a study to uh, create a fines, fees, and forfeiture. And we also maintain the customs warehouse. And then we have the special enforcement, which comprises our detector dog units for narcotics, biosecurity, and agriculture. Uh, the contraband enforcement team that that goes out and takes care of the airport, but uh, they're also part of uh, the federal task forces, and they provide uh, much-needed resources. They go on house raids, they do emergency vehicle operations, prison searches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in some respects, we do pretty much like what the officers you find in the police department do, but. We kind of seem to be like a very, very unique and special hybrid. Um, and then we also have the biosecurity team and the maritime interdiction task force that goes out the, on, on uh, patrols using uh, their safe boat or other vessels uh, to assist in customs uh, enforcement matters. And then we also have the administrative services that take care of the typical payroll budgeting, billing, receivables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you have the Office of Internal Affairs that uh, kind of uh, uh, maintains uh, vigilance over our officers and staff to ensure that everybody's following the, the, uh, the general order regarding um, behavior and, 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 uh, and uh, interaction with not just the public but with each other. And then you have the Office of the Director. Uh, and then there is apparently one more. We, we have the Office of the Public Information Office that takes care of trying to um, uh, maintain uh, our image and, you know, put us in a positive light. Uh, next slide. <coughs> okay. So w if you take a look at this slide, pretty much... Uh, I'm going to read this. It says, Guam Customs has authority in the application of federal laws relating to Guam. It does not, however, apply any tariffs. Because Guam Customs falls outside the jurisdiction of the United States Customs Territory, therefore, importations into Guam are not governed by the Tariff Act of 1930 or the regulations contained in 19 CFR and that the Customs Administration, the Administration of Customs for Guam is under the government of Guam. So basically, when you look at that slide, that's a snapshot of 19 U.S.C. Customs Duties under Section 7.2, Insular Possessions of the United States other than Puerto Rico. So pretty much what they're saying is that, okay, the United States is protected, however, because Guam is here, and they're not part of the U.S. Uh, uh, customs territory, Guam will take care of it. So going back to what I said earlier, we're doing it at the local level with local resources and having to try and do it on our own. And in this day and age, uh, we seem to have grown, uh, but we haven't been able to get over that barrier to get to the next level in, in technology, training, and resources. And, 
and major for the federal, um, for the, I guess for the federal tasks that you guys, that you perform. Do you receive any federal funding? For yes, that? we do. Okay. Uh, we have officers who are assigned to the federal task forces, and um, but does uh, the agency they receive? participate. We receive money through asset forfeitures. So if we didn't have officers assigned to them, we would not receive any of that funding. And then, of course, we've got uh, grant, federal grants that we are available. But um, we're looking at trying to build our capacity. I see. Thank you. Okay, next slide. There you go. So what does this mean? It means that the responsibility for the protection of Guam, its people, including ensuring local and federal assets are protected, is through vigilance at the borders of Guam. It's done through the government of Guam by local government of Guam customs and quarantine agency officers. So as you're going to hear throughout this course of discussion, uh, we do it a, a lot of times with limited or scarce resources. Next slide. And these are, uh, what you see here is like other things that are like not gee whiz information, but uh, this is why we're very contentious when it comes to like payment of rent. Because the federal inspection services like the U.S. Customs and Border Protection are allowed certain allowances to ensure that they don't pay rent directly. And so uh, I, I'm, one of the things that we did was we also attached a copy of, of the web page that basically says if you want to to establish a, a, a border entry for the airport, you must be able to provide space with no direct cost to the, the, the federal service. So uh, I'll just read some of this because I don't know if you can read. It says, as part of the federal inspection service, federal border enforcement entities operate at all ports of entry with space allocated by way of the FIS space requirements and it is important to know that these facilities are provided without direct cost to the federal government. The facilities include warehousing space for the secure storage of imported cargo pending inspection, administrative office space, cargo inspection areas, primary and secondary inspection areas, and any other space necessary for operations. Guam Customs is not afforded this application of the FIS space requirement for providing custom services and is charged monthly for rent, which comes to approximately 2.7. I was told that the number is actually a little bit higher than 2.7 because there was a, a rate change or, or they changed the, the amount that they're billing us. And although not part of the federal government, Guam is delegated the authority to enforce federal laws and should be afforded the same consideration. Next page. Or next slide, sorry. Okay, so when you, when you take a look at this slide, uh, it's not all inclusive, but it basically talks about the challenges that we have regarding lack of personnel, lack of vehicles, equipment, supplies, and other resources, uh, an inadequate legal framework, non-existent customs risk management, computer-based system, uh, and, and some of this have uh, national security impacts. Uh, we have an incongruent application of the customs authority based on federal laws, which apparently do not carry over to Guam Customs. Uh, authoritative control over the ports of entry. You know, some of the things that we've discussed internally among ourselves is uh, we, we're, we're, we're more like tenants. We're paying rent to perform duties at our place where we're supposed to protect these people, it's island, the island and our resources, but we're being charged to, to do so. <clears throat> Okay, so one of the things I'm going to talk about is in the late 90s, we had sufficient personnel to conduct inspections at the borders. As I mentioned earlier, we had like uh, 230 officers, and now we're down to 112. Both the front counters, which is the, the counters you, you, you arrive at when you, after you get your bags, and then there's a secondary counter. The front and the back were filled with officers. Sometimes you didn't even know what to do with them. But with that being said, we had enough officers to board all the aircrafts that were coming in to be able to monitor all the freight being offloaded and actually take inventory. Fast forward to today, you'd be hard pressed. Sometimes if there are three flights and you only have one officer boarding the aircraft, then all of a sudden we get complaints that the aircraft was not met in a timely manner because the, the uh, airlines are, they, they kind of 
like a gig for that and so we hear it so one of the things that we're trying to do is like we, we have to find a stopgap measure to be able to, to fix a lot of our our issues and uh, and I'm hoping that with us opening dialogue here today that we'd be able to at least move to the next level at least uh, oh and one more thing we also had access to a simple computer-based intelligence system that was developed by the University of Guam many years ago that was able to help us at least put some intelligence information uh, on record. Right now, the way we're doing it is that we, we, we don't have that capability and we need to develop it. So our resources, ha our resources have been spread so thinly that our effectiveness has been impacted negatively. In addition to typical customs concerns, national and homeland security concerns relating to the threat of terrorism appeared Increasing the scope of the agency, the agency mission without an adequate increase in technology, personnel, equipment, training, and supplies. And I have to keep reiterating that because it just seems that every year that we continue on, we're doing more with less, more with less, more with less. So what, at, at what point do we end up breaking? We don't know. Next slide. Pretty can much we, what I'm you're going to see is... Uh, pardon me. Can, yes. can we get a copy of the, uh, that PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, I believe uh, you, you already have it. Can I get a hard copy and okay. also for the senators as well? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so hit the, the button into the four hour, the four arrow uh, show. There you go. Okay, so in 1998, you're looking at like um, a snapshot again. So you have the threat of drugs, counterfeit, biosecurity concerns, and public health, and, and whatnot. And what you're looking at is pretty much like the customs officers uh, at the border protecting the people of Guam. Uh, and I mentioned a lot of this earlier, but some of the things that, uh, that we had to contend with is that we had no pre-clearance process, no advance manifest, no customs bonded warehouses, and then when September 11th came along, we had much more in increased security protocols and massive changes in the federal government, which did not automatically translate to helping Guam Customs, because Guam Customs pretty much is overlooked. They're relying on all the other federal entities to be able to pick up the slack. Next slide. Next slide, and do the four hours. Click it into, there you go. So fast forward to 2017, now we're down to 100 and, uh, 112 officers. We have limited access to computer-based information. Uh, we still don't have a customs-based risk assessment, management, intelligence information system. We still do not have pre-clearance processes. We do not have uh, access to advanced manifest. We do not have resources. Uh, and technology has created an enforcement gap to protect the island. So if one of the things that we were talking about in this conference was that if we were able to fix our capability or capacity dealing with managing, management information technology, we could probably do with, with a little bit less. Does that mean that we're going to get rid of the officers? No, because we need them. We still need physical uh, presence at the borders. Now, Keep in mind that everything is paper logged. And so imagine if we had access to advanced manifest for passengers for freight. We have a team that already does the research or we feed it through our, our customs risk management information system. And then pretty much it'll spit out a few names or a few uh, 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 items of interest. And then pretty much everybody else is cleared through the process. But we don't have that. Everything is paper intensive. When you go over to the customs window down at the port and you have like a hundred documents that have to be re reviewed by the customs officer sitting there, imagine how much time is wasted by the guy just waiting on the other side of the window. And what we want to do is we want to ensure that we're able to facilitate and expedite movement of freight. And we're also looking at some of the things that were discussed were uh, what they call a harmonized system in which there's a code utilized to track um, all the freight. Using that, 
that in tangent with a computer-based risk management system would help to expedite uh, the movement and, and ensure facilitation of trade. Next slide. Pretty much uh, the weight board is, this slide basically says acquire the necessary equipment, supplies, etc. hire officers as appropriate, overhaul, revamp legislation, uh, use uh, appropriate technology and information technology platforms, and collaborate with federal, local, and regional stakeholders. <coughs> Next slide. Next slide. When you say revamp legislation, what do you mean? Well, you have to imagine that our, our legislation it, uh, was crafted, if I'm not mistaken, in the 80s? 90s? 5 chapter 73. Can you come to the table, please, so you can see the mic and identify well, yourself? Well, it, it's like you have a car, right? And the car operates. I don't. I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking about yeah. specifics. When you say okay. revamp legislation, what do you mean? Okay. So, uh, if you take into consideration the authority that we, we have, okay. I, I mentioned earlier, federal inspection services are are, are not paying uh, any type of rental for and our afforded space. So that's they, at the federal level. Yeah. So we don't so have anything that basically says Guam Customs has the same authority equivalent to the federal service to be able to do that. So how do we do that for you? How do we give you that authority? I'm I'm thinking that we put that in in a local legislation, or we we network with with uh, our congresswoman. So okay. So I, I think I'm trying to what I'm what I'm alluding to. I'm not what I'm alluding to. I'm I'm just trying to clarify because mm -hmm. we had a meeting, so I'm trying to get you to the to the point. In our meeting, you said that the statutes need to be overlooked, and you needed to change that. Overhauled. Overhauled. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about that. This, this is the real meat here. Yes. Right? So let's talk about that. Um, one of the things that we, there have been different approaches towards uh, uh, legislation, right, and, and looking at it. And, and so we, we were looking at uh, possibility of taking the 19 USC and then, like, taking that and cutting and pasting it into uh, Guam law, the, the, and which is fine because a, a lot of us say, yeah, that's a good way forward. But in order to be able to do that, you must have, you, you have to ensure that you have the proper resources. You can't take a 30-page a document and place it in the lap of Guam Customs and say, here you go, move forward, and our, our capacity is only to be able to do a certain portion of it. What we may need to do is, if we're, we're going to take a look at that type of legislation, we have to phase it in in, in increments. Because how do you eat an elephant? You can't just sit at one sitting and, and, and eat it all. Yeah. So you, we have to take a look at all these little things. And a lot of us have very good ideas, but we're, we're all over the place. Our plates are full every day. We're, we're at a meeting, at a hearing. And, and so a lot of times we're trying to prioritize. Can you give um, me something uh, a little bit more specific, Major? Uh, of something concrete, an example. Okay. Yeah, Senator, I'm actually uh, not here officially as a customs officer because I'm on leave. I'm actually on military duty, but I got authorization to uh, be able to attend and represent uh, the agency for questions that that I could potentially answer and provide information to this esteemed body. Um, and so, for the hearing purpose, I'm Major Phil Tyron. Uh, from the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency, and I'm currently on leave. Uh, some examples of the legislation that Major Perez is alluding to uh, deal with uh, customs type, uh, border protection type terms like declaration, invoices, uh, value, bonds. When he spoke about uh, customs management information system uh, and also a phased approach to it, uh, he's actually on target. Uh, there, after the commencement of the uh, Oceania Customs Organization uh, conference, uh, there was a discussion, a critical discussion uh, meeting that took place uh, um, at the last day of that uh, uh, conference, and that was a meeting that was uh, that uh, occurred between UNCTAD, the representatives from the United Nations uh, Committee on 
trade and development I, I don't know if I have the acronym correct uh, but they um, provide support for Asakuda so Asakuda is a customs uh, automation uh, information system and it allows you to perform customs work more efficiently and it allows you to perform better targeting just like Major Perez alluded to in his uh, in his testimony earlier however uh, as he stated as well our legislation currently does not support that the current legislation that we have under chapter 5 GCA chapter 73 reflects a Navy era type statute in fact one of the statutes continues to talk about a guard on vessel and those are terms and um, customs practices that have been used before by the Navy so uh, when he speaks about uh, a phased approach uh, I, pro I propose to um, the group that we're working with at UNCTAD that uh, what we need to do is uh, is introduce legislation that first um, puts or sets in motion and sets in place a broker program a customs broker program would allow customs officers to be able to really be doing customs work and the customs brokers are trained by customs officers in all the processes that are required in order for trade facilitation to take place uh, if taxes are due the brokers are the ones that take care of that if there are specific requirements uh, they also handle that and they ca they contribute to easing trade at the border that's just the first step uh, once that takes place then ASICUDA, which is the uh, automated system, can actually kick in because the brokers are a critical component to the success of the ASICUDA program. Say, say that again, the what program? ASICUDA. Oh, yes, okay. Right. Uh, you'll, uh, when Major Paris provides his presentation, yes. you'll see it in there. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's not... Uh, and it's not as if we have not... Oh, sorry. Right, and it's not as if we have been just sitting around and not uh, attempting to make any type of headway. Um, the the uh, concept that Major Perez uh, mentioned about uh, cutting and pasting uh, 19 USC has already actually been done. I did this back in 1989, and I went through and read the statute over again just to make sure. The, the hesitation that I have, even as confident as I am, is that there requires more than just one mind uh, to set this in motion because it's going to affect our entire economy uh, because the, imp the different uh, requirements uh, will, if not performed properly, will put a constraint on trade. And so we have to be careful of that. There are also the existing statutes that tie into other local statutes. And if we decided to overhaul and completely repeal and reenact it in a different uh, uh, manner, then that again is a complex process. So it, it's like he said, a phased approach is important, uh, perhaps using current statutes, but repealing certain sections and, and modifying them to become uh, modern, uh, to serve us more uh, in today's modern times uh, might be more applicable. Have you, have you already, I'm, I'm, I'm under the impression that you've already started doing this work? Yes, this phase of I, I presented this document to the director two or three months ago when I was the acting chief. So can we get a copy of this? Is there anything you'd like us to help with you move forward? Right. Anything with the customs and quarantine? Has it been vetted? Has it been studied? Has it been tested? Senator, uh, you are on point. Those are the exact same things that we need to focus on once uh, I, I, I suggest my recommendation is we put a team together some folks from our um, from our agency some folks from the legislature some folks from web and tax some folks also from the governor's office uh, BBMR and when we start to right and any other stakeholder that has a vested interest
Next slide. <laughs> We've already discussed um, the way forward here, so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we've discussed that too. Next slide. Uh, we've discussed that. Next slide. Uh, okay, so pretty much uh, for the purposes of the Oceanic Customs Organization Conference, one of the things that we, we uh, uh, put out there was that instead of having an individually centric approach towards border security, if we're able to develop and build capacity in our different areas and um, increase uh, management information technology, uh, we could go a whole lot uh, longer ways towards protecting our region as a collaborative effort. But some of our administrations within the Pacific are challenge like we are, but at least we have the membership of the Oceanic Customs Organization and the assistance of the World Customs Organization, the European Union, uh, and other entities that have heard our plight here in, with Guam and Guam Customs, and we're working towards uh, opening up dialogue uh, with them and also with our federal counterparts to uh, build capacity. And next slide. And I believe that is it for my presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you for uh, your patience. Major, please forgive me. Uh, I, I would like to hear um, Director McDonald's testimony. Will you be reading it on his behalf? Do you have a copy of it? No, I don't, Senator. Okay. May I give it to you to read for public record so that they can hear it? Because he, he touches base on a lot of the challenges that Customs and Quarantines uh, faces. So would you mind? That's fine, Senator. You are the most senior, right? And uh, forgive me again, do you have one of your own that you'd like to read as well? No, I don't, Senator. Okay. This memorandum that I'm about to read is from Director James McDonald to the Honorable Eddie D. Calvo, Governor of Guam. Subject matter is the after action report in reference of the Guam Customs hosting of the 19th Oceania Customs Organizational Annual Conference. First heading is highlights and accomplishments. Through the coordinated efforts of the Governor of Guam, Guam Customs was able to host a regional conference for all Oceania Customs heads of administrations from throughout Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia. The Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency entered into an agreement with the Guam Visitors Bureau in order to produce the 19th OCO Annual Conference. It is doubtful that Guam Customs would have been able to produce this conference without the assistance of the governor. Amplifying the success was through collaborating with GVB with its latitude and flexibility concerning procurement. Guam Customs had a hard working budget of $50,000 in which to work with. GVB provided invaluable assistance and in-kind donations for delegates. The 19th Oceania Customs Organization Annual Conference was held from May 2nd, May 5th, 2017. The conference brought together about 50 delegates representing 23 customs administrations of the Pacific Island countries and territories including Australia and New Zealand, 
as well as global stakeholders and representatives of international and regional organizations and development partners, such as the World Bank, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the United Nations Conference of Trade and Development, and the World Customs Organization. Conference participants discuss customs modernization and reforms related to the conference theme, data analysis for effective order management. Second topic, assessment. The conference brings to light challenges faced by small customs administrations in the protection of their borders as well as challenges to facilitating trade. Discussion on the Escuda Automated System for Customs Data. The Escuda is a fully integrated customs management information system developed by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development that incorporates the customs processes into a single manageable and computerized process. This is one of a few MIS platforms in use by customs administrations. The implementation of such a program for use by CQA would exponentially increase screening, inspecting, and processing of merchandise, freight, and containerized cargo by identifying only those items of interest to customs and allowing quicker release for the rest. The, uh, this is an acronym. The uh, UNCTAD has indicated interest in possibly assisting Guam. Typically, this assistance is afforded by developing countries. And the acronym of UNCTAD is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Discussion on use of harmonized system. The OCO membership discussed the status of HS 2017, the harmonized commodity description and coding system, generally referred to as the harmonized system. The harmonized system is a multi-purpose international product nomenclature identification system developed by the World Customs Organization. Each commodity is identified by a six-digit code arranged in a legal and logical structure and is supported by well-defined rules to achieve uniform classification. The system is used more than 200 countries and economies as a basis for their customs tariffs and for the collection of international trade statistics. The use of the HS and a system like the SCUDA will help to expedite and reduce cost to legitimate trade. The, governor, the government of Guam and the industry in Guam could only benefit from its use. It is extensively used by governments, international organizations, and the private sector for many other purposes such as international taxes, trade policies, monitoring of controlled goods, rules of origin, freight tariffs, transport statistics, price monitoring, quota controls, compilation of national accounts, and an economic research analysis. The harmonized system is a universal economic language and a code for goods and is indispensable to for international trade. Another topic, CQA-centric issues presented. Need for automation for customs Major, processes. Major, pardon me. I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to welcome Deaf Director McDonald. Perhaps he can take off, pick up where he left off. He's a ninja. I didn't even know he stepped in. <laughs> yes, sir. I Senior know. leadership stuff. I know. Thank you for. And I, I would like to apologize to the, you know, the chair and everyone else here for my uh, delay. But uh, I had a full day down there, and they wanted all department heads to be there to meet with uh, heads of FEMA and uh, DHS. So, uh, apologize. Uh. No, thank you for being here, sir. 
So uh, Major was reading your uh, testimony that you submitted about the conference you just had. So I'd like to give you the opportunity just to finish it off because you made some really good points on your recommendation. Okay, a need for uh, automation of customs processes. Capacity building is a proactive initiative by Australia, New Zealand, and France on behalf of their territories. Small number administrations in the Pacific are more technologically advanced, instituted computerized customs data and risk analysis software and operating systems. The United States does not provide any such support for Guam. Many OCO members were surprised to hear that Guam has no such system. The method, of, the method of customs processing and collection of data involves the use of hard copy running logs and intense collection of paper data. The method of data collection, analysis, dissemination is problematically outdated for the technology that has been made readily available for developing countries by Australia, New Zealand, France, the United Nations, the European Union, World Bank, and the World Customs Organization. Guam Customs gave a presentation discussing its own challenges towards building its capacity. CQA capacity building. The wide perception among OCA members is that the United States federal government shares its technology with Guam Customs and directly contributes to fund to funding Guam Customs program areas in order to remain consistent with technology currently in use by U.S. CBP. The OCO membership has been made aware that this is not the case and that Guam Customs is deficient in this regard to collect, analyze, and properly assess risk its capacity. If Guam were in an international airport located at the border of the mainland of the United States, the U.S. CBP would provide the immigration service as well as the custom service. Since Guam is outside the United States custom territory, the service of customs inspections is provided by the government of Guam, but with very limited resources. Guam Customs would like to open a dialogue with the United States Customs and Border Protection to discuss capacity building strategies to strengthen, reinforce, and to protect our island border. Inconsistent application and support of federal laws. There are inconsi inconsistent levels of federal authority what, what do not translate equally from the federal laws of the United States Customs and Border Protection to Guam Customs. 19 USCSC, 19 USC, which identifies that Guam is outside the United States Customs Territory and therefore the protection of Guam borders is done through the local government. 19 USC did not speak to any other federal regulations which reinforce and provide greater authority for federal entities like US CBP but not Guam Customs. For example, there are federal inspection service space requirements which allow federal services at port, ports of entry allocated space to perform its inspections as well as administrative support functions without direct cost to US CBP versus Guam Customs paying for rent to carry out its mandate. The US Department of Transportation, FA Federal Avi Aviation Administration Advisory Circular 15360-13 Planning and Design Guidelines for Airport Terminal Facilities, specific mention of no cost of federal inspection services can be found at this website. There is no local legal authority to provide advanced customs manifests, unlike with our federal counterparts at US CBP, but because of the immigration's function it covers by the federal government in Guam, the requirement to provide these documents in advance to Guam custom, Customs does, doesn't apply because the nexus between the federal law does not translate to equal application of authority and direct financial, administrative, or logistical support. Inadequate legal framework for 
CQA Customs Authority. Since the September 11, 2001 terror attacks, we have been massive changes. There has been massive changes towards the increase of security and, and the integrity of homeland security and the protection of our nation borders through federal law and policy. These responsibilities are also placed in Guam Customs, yet there have been no changes in law to, pro to provide the resources to CQA to keep par with these federal changes. Because no additional funding is provided to Guam, CQA is expected to meet the same standards, but to do so within its own limited means. Ad additionally, CQA does not have the flexibility to hire as needed and are subject to administrative hurdles which negatively impact or our capability to hire additional officers or promote current staff into critical areas of responsibility. Guam Customs Enabling Law is in dire need of overhauling to meet these standards as well as to articulate its legal authority at the borders. There are many changes that are necessary to Guam law, including perhaps addressing the inadequacies via the Organic Act to ensure equal protection of Guam, its people, and its resources in order. Recommendation. Develop and implement a customs risk-based data management information system which incorporates the use of harmonized coding. Two. Reach out to U.S. CBP and Congress to address deficiencies in application of federal regulations, laws, etc., which do not translate equally from federal to local authority. Three, through federal or local statute, ensure provisions such as the Federal Inspection Service allowances for, for providing space to perform mandated inspection apply equally to Guam to ensure proper and fair application of laws as it relates to customs authorities at the borders. In this regard, CQA could apply what is currently charged for rent towards the improvement and sustainability of the customs enforcement program. Four, establish a process with federal entities which provides capacity building for Guam Customs to strengthen its Guam's borders. Five, revamp Guam Customs mandate to ensure that CQA has the necessary and appropriate authority in the protection of its borders. That's it, um, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Director. You know, the, uh, your testimony really took, uh, puts a lot of light on the recommendations needed for Customs and Quarantine. Um, but it, it seems, curiously enough for me, that this, these uh, issues that you've been having have been plaguing you for years. So what can we, what can we do about it now? I'd also like to call uh, Officer Fred Uggen. I, I, I remember you wanted to speak and say something, so please come up to the table. Good afternoon, Senator. My name is Fred Ogan, and I'm an officer with Guam Customs and Quarantine. I just wanted to contribute to Major Vince's uh, fine presentation, PowerPoint presentation. You had uh, posed a question to him regarding how do we improve legislation for customs. And pretty much, Director McDonald has a basis on it through his memorandum. But at that point, I felt necessary to kind of raise my concern because I didn't want it to blow over. Anyways, I'm under the understanding that the Guam, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency, which used to be the former Immigration Naturalization Service, situated at the second floor of the, of the airport, okay. prior to coming to Customs, Okay, so what I understand is they, they actually don't pay a rental fee to perform their, 
their duties there as immigration service. Now they're called the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. So up to, up to date, in the past, and when they were called U.S. Immigration, they didn't yes, pay rent? Yes, my understanding is they are not paying a and rental. And now they're not paying rent. They still are not border. paying rental. I okay. wanted to bring that up because you had asked how do we improve legislation. Major Vince, I brought up a point that we are paying rental space to the Guam International Airport Authority to perform our job as customs officers. But not only are we inspectors, we also are part of commerce. Every passenger, every cargo, every vessel, every air, aircraft that comes to Guam, they present a document to a customs officer and it goes through a screening, whether it's an aircraft, a vessel, it goes through proper screening. We are trained for that. We will grant them the clearance based on the conditions, whether there's any passengers on board and whether they have the proper documentation to, for entry into Guam. When they proceed down after immigrations, they present a customs agriculture declaration form. We screen that also for enterability. I don't like to use the, pro, the, the word profiling, but we do have to interview and base and based on that interview, determine whether that passenger needs to go back for further inspection. When cargo comes to Guam, and I was listening on earlier on the harmonized system, we don't have that in place. It's paper intensive. We have passenger protection, cargo, manifests we have cargo invoices that we have to screen so everything that touches enters into our border manually manually there is a customs officer manually touching that document mm -hmm. whether it's aircraft vessel passenger cargo so that's kind of what I wanted to bring to light because um, it wasn't said earlier and I wanted it on record. And during Director McDonald's confirmation hearing, I believe it was back in August, if I'm not mistaken, he had mentioned that when he went to Japan, there was a passenger inspection fee of maybe 30, 30 some dollars. And when he entered, when his son entered into Oregon, there was a customs passenger inspection fee of $70, I believe. Currently, we're, we're at $10 per head, passenger inspection fee. So back to your question of how do we improve legislation, we need, Senator, to up our passenger inspection fee. Yes, so uh, when was the last time your passenger inspection fee was... When was the last time you increased your passenger inspection fee? This is for people that are traveling, coming in through our borders, right? Through the airline? Is this the fee? It was in, uh, increased in 2012, uh, Madam Chair. 2012. Okay. And what is stopping you from increasing it today? Why, why haven't we been doing it annually? We've been receiving more visitors according to GBB. It's ten dollars. So Just for the record, ma'am, uh, right now it's eight twenty nine. It eight dollars and twenty nine cents. Yes, and uh, wow. uh, I'm glad to mention that I I assigned a major field tyrant to uh, to uh, have it notated in the airport uh, meeting. And uh, Major Tyron did Major. mention that, that we have the intent of uh, raising that fee to a level that, uh, you know, that will uh, be sufficient for our operations. Can you explain the process of raising that fee? Major
Major Tyron, you want to go ahead and uh, elaborate on that? Yes, um, the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency is funded through the Customs Agriculture Quarantine Inspection Service Fund. Uh, the fund consists of uh, um, several areas where charges or fees are charged to recover the cost of the work that customs officers perform. At the airport, it's uh, a passenger inspection fee. And that passenger inspection fee is uh, regulated uh, very closely by the Federal Aviation Administration so that there's not a uh, violation of the uh, Airline Deregulation Act or the Anti-Head Tax Act. Um, the process is very similar uh, when you look at the regulation uh, in 4 GAR uh, that relates to our, uh, our fee. And what it does is there's a mechanism that uh, come every September um, we're required to perform a reconciliation. So uh, the director uh, relies heavily on our administrative services officer to be tracking um, expenditures, costs, so that at that point in time, we're able to discuss with our airport uh, um, team, uh, and I'll call them a team because uh, they're very supportive. Uh, when we call out to reach out to them, they want to help us. They want to provide us the, the information. Our issue is that on the customs side, we have not been uh, leveraging the opportunities to track the information better so that when we sit at the table, our numbers are coinciding. And so it's a matter of collecting data? Correct. Yes, and so um, when that reconciliation process occurs, there's also a timeline uh, within which the airline operators are given the uh, opportunity to provide input if our intent is to raise the fee. Our fee, right, uh, cannot be raised unless the airline, uh, I'm sorry, unless the airport authority includes that in their fee structure. And so that's one of the, the things that ties us together and that's why we're, that's why I refer to us as a team. So please bear with me because you, you, I'm asking you these questions. You guys have been working in this agency for so long. How did the airport even get this authority? How did they get this kind of authority to you'd have to work with them to it's it's in our it's in our regulation that four, i believe it's for gar chapter five if i'm correct or so article you, five you have to request through the airport to get an increase in your service fee and then it's up to them to decide whether you're going to get that increase or not uh, not necessarily that we're uh, requesting their uh, authority their permission but they also track uh, the number of passengers that are coming through. And so they also have a vested interest in the operations of the airlines and their ability to, uh, to produce revenue to continue their operations. Uh, theirs is mainly to um, track because... When is the timeline that you have to submit this document for the airport, this data? Um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I was getting to the point that each airline operator is responsible for submitting uh, the revenue passengers, uh, the number of revenue passengers that they bring in every to, month. To the airport. Yes, and they are supposed to send that to the airport authority. How that come they don't just send it directly to you? There, there's a, uh, I don't understand the true intricacies, intricacies of it, but it has to deal with, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the taxation and with uh, our ability to it's a cost recovery thing. So we're responsible for telling them what it costs us costs us to operate, and then the airport operator is who actually collects that from the airport authority. Otherwise, it, if we collect it directly, it appears to be a tax. Okay. And so... A, I, so I, I'm sorry, forgive me. No problem. I'm trying to move us forward. So I understand that the airline gives the documentation the airport yes then the airport gives you the data not directly uh, in fact our ASO has been uh, speaking to me about that uh, and saying that uh, it's an area that we need to improve on and do better why don't they give you it directly because of some kind of tax the regulation doesn't require them to give it to us directly uh, we can ask them for it uh, for GAR article 5 if I'm correct how about the fee? Does the money go directly to you? Not just the, no. not, this is data. We were talking about data, so now let's talk about the fee. Right. The airport. Yeah. The airport collects that. Uh, 
the airport collects that on our behalf. The airport collects the fee that you work hard to get on your behalf from the airline. Right. And do they give this to money to you automatically, or how long does it take before you see this fee? Can, can maybe at this point, right, because this is the mechanical part, I might want to have our ASO maybe explain that, because he's probably better versed at it. Okay. Yes, they, they send that to us after the fact, like sometimes uh, two, three months. So two or three months after you have performed, after the customs and quarantines have performed the services for the airport to even receive personnel to operate anyway. Yes. And how long has this been going on? Uh, probably since the inception, like since 1994. And no one has thought that there was anything wrong with that? This takes away your autonomy. You're being delayed. Your 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 personnel, your operations is being delayed two to three months for the hard work that they put in. It's been five years since we've requested a fee increase. We are behind nationally with our passenger fee. What what is there something that I'm not seeing? An underlying issue, a challenge that's preventing the customs and quarantines to receive this passenger fee? directly that's preventing them other than the data other than updating this Ford VAR statute it just seems very simple fix to me is it as simple as I think it is or is it a little bit more complicated sir senator to answer your question um, when this Isn't the uh, service being done to the customs and no, quarantine? Detection? What happened right? was it's just historically since its implementation, the airport has always been the sole collector of these fees. It's the reason being that because the airport is the is the agency that has the accountability on the number of passengers that are getting off these aircraft upon arrival into Guam. I understand and that. What they do is they take that money and then they break it down with their own cut or so of administrative fees. And then that's when they will give an electronic report to Mr. Diaz as to for this quarter, this is how much was collected from the passengers. Oh, so they do it the on a quarterly basis. The problem with that with customs on quarantine or whatever, we're just taking the word of the airport. I'm sorry, Major. Can you repeat what you just said? Yes. The problem with that is that we don't have a check and balance of really is that the actual count of passengers that came in for that period of time that the airport is staying. So we're basically, it's a trust thing. All right? So you have no way to verify what the numbers you get is accurate? No, we don't have that in place at this time, but we will have it in place. I think as the years went by, I think we have to be whole, we have to take care of and take the lead to make sure that we are getting the actual amount of money that we deserve mm -hmm. and not basically just basing on what information was given to us. Director McDonald and the ASO and the other majors were aware of this. This is one of the things, and I know that in our last meeting, that's one of the things you brought up also. You kind of like, really? <laughs> you know, and uh, yes, I can understand what you're saying. But there, there will be a mechanism set up so that we have this check and balance and accountability. Now, if we have, and you, and you did mention that you spoke with the airport personnel yes. management, and you said that they're willing to assist us in any way to, to increase our passenger fee, to, to do whatever we need to do. And we will take that offer, we will take them off on that offer, so that um, towards the, the future, that we do have an accountability both not only for the airport but also for customs. You know, I, I, I am, I'm, I'm very, you know, the, the airport was very welcoming and very open to assisting customs and quarantine, but after hearing what you, all, this, all these issues that you guys are dealing with, um, and you, ha you didn't even mention like 70% of the issues that we've talked about in your PowerPoint slide, I was a little bit, you know, yeah. So, we need to work 
and making me have that autonomy, that power to, it, it, essentially it's like um, Senator Castro, I'm, I'm doing my job, but Senator Castro is going to say, okay, uh, I'm going to give you your money when, when three months from now. And that's just not right. And if I, if I have my own office, and I, I should have my own budget, and I should have access to the, my own data, and that's essentially what you are. You're an agency, you should have access to the data, you should have access to the budget. But you don't, is what I'm hearing. That is correct. Okay. This seems, okay, I would like to, if Senator Castro, do you have any questions? Okay. No, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor up for Senator Castro, but I want to, for the record, I'd like to do another informational hearing okay, and, and really get to dig into the weeds of everything and um, to see progress, especially with this passenger inspection fee. I don't, I don't, I think that you deserve more as an agency. I think that you should have access to this inspection fee. I think that we need to create a law that gives you access to this inspection fee and also the data directly from the airline. Uh, yes, yes Mr. Again. I mean, we have to do what we can. We'll see what we can do to create something. Yes. Right, create that model. That That's very understandable, um, um, Senator. The, uh, the thing that we need to address, to one of your questions was, well, why has there never been an increase in the passenger fee in the last the last time it was Five 2012, years. yes. And it's just the bureaucratic red tape that we have to go through yeah. to the AAA process, the um. Administrative Adjudication Act. Let's just say, any increase in any fee is just a bad taste to everybody, all right? We're going to raise the passenger fee, airlines going to go, why? All right. Um, GVB is going to say, uh, you know, that's really going to affect tourism here because it's going to be costly for the passengers. It, it's, just, it's just a bad taste. Every time you say we're going to raise something, right? And this is with other agencies also, government agencies. Every time they come in front of the centers, they want to raise fees. They're always, why? Why do you need? But that's one of the factors also that discourage us from trying to move and increase the, the uh, user fee. Another avenue that we can pre uh, look look at is instead of is there another alternative method other than going to the AAA process? Is could it be something that you can help us yeah. to expedite the uh, whenever we need a, an increase and we can justify it that we don't have to go to this long process of the AAA? So that's that's another contributing factor that kind of like. Uh, made that 2012 $8.29 remain as it is five years later. You know, Major, thank you, but I'm not buying it where uh, GB, how, you, how you stated that GVB is concerned about the, that it's going to impact tourism. Essentially, it, it's kind of selling our island short. You know, we're a tourist destination. It's our number one economy, one of our pillars. And, if I want to fly to Guam and I don't live, you know, if I want to see Guam, I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay more than $8 to want to see Guam. I mean, that's how much, you know, uh, pride we have in our island and in the people. Uh, if we have that pride as locals, then I'm pretty sure that guests have that pride as well. And so, um, yeah, I don't buy that. You know, I think this, this needs to be done immediately. And I know that there's a timeline that you have to meet in order to increase your passenger inspection fee. And all of us should know, what, what, even myself, what is that timeline? But we don't know what that timeline is as a state. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, Senator Castro, do you, would you like to ask a few questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to first of all extend my kudos to the director and uh, his all-star team up here for providing an excellent assessment, what I think is a good foundation director, excellent assessment and uh, list of recommendations. Um, it's cl clear that some are within the authority of the Guam legislature and others well outside our jurisdiction, uh, but not outside our political will and advocacy. Uh, we could talk about that with the, with, the, with the chair of the committee in areas, I, I believe, Major, we had briefly discussed, or one of you, 
about what the CNMI is doing with respect to their customs organization and the kind of authorities they have granted onto them. Okay, so we could follow that up. She's arranging for that trip to happen tomorrow. And <laughs> Uh, if you haven't noticed, our chair is very bullish about uh, getting to the bottom line with a lot of these recommendations. And so, having grown up in uh, a customs family, literally, uh, I learned at a young age that the customs, uh, your your bureau, your agency, uh, generates a significant amount of revenue, uh, whether it's through the fees such as the passenger or cargo fees, right, inspection fees that you generate to the tune of $8 million dollars. Uh, but as a friend, as a friend coming to you and listening to your team, I want to encourage you, Director, and we've, we've gone through this exercise, and I want to just kind of extend this tool to you as well, Major and Majors, that uh, it would really be to your benefit going forward if you can give us examples on how these increases in manpower or tools uh, could impact the community from a dollar and cents perspective, from a return on investment. Let me give you an example. If you increased, and I don't know the answer, it's hypothetical, if you increased the amount of officers at the Port Authority to conduct the necessary inspections by 10, let's say you got 10 new uniformed personnel down there, what would that translate to based on historical data in terms of citations? Would that be an additional 300,000 in import taxes or associated fines and fees? Just, just food for thought. Uh, in addition to that, I've heard it both from the majors, uh, director, they were doing a great job articulating the needs of the department, and then I heard it in your testimony about the need for an additional investments in technology. This is, maybe you can answer this. Do you have a rough dollar amount about how much that would cost? I'll give you an example. The Guam Memorial Hospital, when they say we need additional technology investments for the purposes of um, medical e-records, e they're able to articulate that it would cost them maybe $20 million, and then they delineate what all of that might look like if you had a $20 million check. This, do, do either of you just kind of have a ballpark figure of what the necessary dollar amount would be to invest in that technology? Just maybe ballpark it. Senator, it, it's quite difficult to give you uh, a ballpark figure. In our meeting with the Asakuda uh, representative, right, um, because our because our uh, proposal uh, for our RFP was quite expansive, and uh, and our met our metrics uh, weren't clearly specified. Because that's what we got out of our meeting was he provided us a uh, a rubric uh, which contained metrics in it and where we have more specificity in what we're asking for. And so in our current proposal, right, when you're talking ballpark, it can be from, as he, in his words, it's from 1 million to 100 million, depending on the size and, and, uh, and the scope, what, can, what the system can produce. So uh, I'm aware that uh, 15 or 17 years ago, New Zealand had a system uh, called Cosmod, right? And Cosmod at that time cost them 50 million. They just they just changed to a single uh, user, uh, single face user, single face user. You're probably more familiar with these uh, technical system terms, there, Senator. But it's a single window. There you go, a single window where all of the traders are now able to do it. Um, they invested. Uh, do you recall the figure? Man, I, I, the fig the figure eludes me. Um, but over a six-year period was how they were able to amortize the... Uh exactly. And so that would be my point, Director. If you have a ballpark, whether it's 50 or 100 or 10 or 5, I think if you can help the committee uh, understand and articulate where those monies may be invested, we can come back to you and suggest other ways to finance. I'll give you an example. So we looked at uh, the Interoperable Communications Working Group recommendation for a 12 to $14 million investment. Remember the emergency comms two-way? We didn't have $12 million to drop in that in that new system, but we did uh, petition the governor to reach into DOI, and he dedicated $2 million a year to pay the system down. So that's the kind of um, uh, additional data I think I'm needing, and maybe the chair, so that when, we, when, when you come at us with $15 million, 
we're able to say, okay, amortize over 50 years or 10 or five or four. But you never know, Major, that the Trump administration's investment, the $1 billion anticipated stimulus in infrastructure may be loosely applied to technology infrastructure. So I wanna leave that food for thought. But let me go down my, my punch list. Thank you for attempting to answer that. Some, one of the presenters earlier, Director, discussed about, uh, shared maybe the idea of rolling back or delaying the implementation of certain laws that you are not, the department is not able to fulfill. And so I'll ask one because it was an important law that as the deputy at the Bureau of Statistics and Plans, you and I were very concerned about. And it's Public Law 33-933 with respect to uh, attaining the type of data that comes in the ports of entry and we're talking about produce. Now the Bureau is supposed to gather that data, but we all know it's you folks who are supposed to intercept that and then categorize that, record it, and send it over to BSP. And unfortunately, given this day and age and the realities of your situation, that's probably gonna be in a ton of reams of paper in a cardboard box in a pickup or a van and shipped on over literally for my people to manually input. So that's an example of a law that has overextended into the already limited operations and internal capacities of your, of your department. I would also encourage you as a friend of, of customs to start delineating those types of mandates that require additional financial support. Otherwise, you're gonna find yourself in violation of the law. And, and we, we certainly wanna work with you to, to address that. I, want, I would like to ask your opinion, Director, with respect to agricultural inspections and, was, and what was once the function of the Department of Agriculture. As you know, we have a shared affinity for the natural resources. That includes collecting data, that includes conservation initiatives, that includes other things like inspections, which is your realm. And you don't have to give me a definitive answer, but I just want your at least working opinion. How do you feel about that function reverting back to the Guam Department of Agriculture? Any one of you, the former PPQ. All right. Um, I'm not in favor of returning that uh, authority back to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, as it stands, the way that we're currently uh, structured, it allows a full, it, it's, it creates the opportunity for the Department of Agriculture to focus on the inland issues and Guam Customs to focus on the issues at the border relating to PPQ and the current uh, arrangement is actually uh, robust and actually supports better uh, better enforcement because at any time during uh, a crisis either agency can call upon the other to uh, request for assistance uh, just from an operational standpoint I appreciate your your opinion uh, last two points but I'm sure um, again, coming with some recommendations to you so we can help each other make a legitimate case in support of customs requests, fiscal requests. Guam law has um, a lot of language relative to use tax, right? The use or consumption tax. And I appreciate the fact that you folks are doing your due diligence collecting the use tax with our third party carriers, private carriers. I came across an article within the last 30 days that, that basically said one third of all clothing items purchased in CONUS is done online. As a me former member of the fiscal policy team of the administration, we can acknowledge that we're hemorrhaging collections in areas that we're probably not fully even understanding. I suspect, Director, that's in the area of imports and the things like Amazon and eBay and there is a major gap there because, first of all, the use tax only captures its application for products or certain pro commodities at a, at a price that may be $1,000 or above. I think we need to revisit that. But where I'm really having some uh, difficulty wrapping my mind around, and this is where you're going to get me really impassioned down the line, is when our federal counterparts will not allow us, or for some reason if we haven't acted, I want to act on it now with this chairperson, to be able to quote unquote station a customs officer at that parcel post pickup on a honor basis and if the person has purged himself when you say i'm sorry you're randomly selected may i look at your package oh mr Custer, you bought a rhino bowling ball and it says here it's valued at 152 and you didn't pay your 2.5 percent use tax 
not only do you owe us the four dollars and fifty cents or whatever that mathematical thing is but you owe us an additional twenty five dollars because you failed to declare that what i want to encourage you to do director with your extremely intelligent and experienced team here is start doing some pro formas about what that means i'll give you an example dhl sorry wrong carrier somebody somewhere gave me a loose number about one year in the last five years that inbound parcels had increased by 3,000%. So if you take 3,000% and you average out the weight and the number of parcels and you just assign a very basic dollar figure and you prorate that against USPS parcels, which is public information, you can only imagine the kind of use tax revenues you may be able to generate. And so I want to work with you on that. And then I'll, I'll finish with this one point. Actually, it's a question and it's kind of a, a point hidden within a question and then you can take it from there. I'm curious as to what role Guam Customs plays in the protection of our domestic border. Uh, in, insofar as uh, GPD's Maritime Division, uh, Agricultural Conservation Division, uh, and in the broader context of GFD, GFD, Homeland Security and Fusion Center. And if that's an area of weakness, how can we fix that so that we can satisfy both your mission but a greater public safety concern like preventing illegal trafficking and importation of contraband and illegal fishing and so forth. Senator, I like, uh, I'm glad you brought that topic up about uh, the excise tax. Okay, uh, I have assigned uh, Major uh, Taiwan to take a look at the MOU that Saipan has with the U.S. Postal System and I just wanted uh, you know, to be on record that uh, Saipan collects $4 million a month on their excise tax at, at the U.S. Postal Facility in Saipan. So I've, we've had conversations with our counterparts from uh, the San Francisco office of the U.S. Postal uh, Service, and they've agreed to, to start up that talks and probably have the same uh, framework you know, as uh, Saipan. So uh, we're we're working on that right now, so you can imagine Guam probably doubling, doubling that, that figure. You know, instead of four million, we'll probably get, you know, eight million or more here in Guam to collect at the U.S. Postal Service. So that's in the work, Senator. I'm glad, uh, you know, you mentioned that. Well, thank you, Director. Madam Chair, you have uh, also a question. Sorry, Madam Chair. Yes, just to touch on, on base because we're in the subject of use tax. I'd like to go on the record though today that I'm here in support of my management in moving this agency forward and helping to create legislation and to promulgate legislation so that we can have a more harmon harmonized agency. Okay. It is on the subject of use tax, Senator. That's true. Um, that's one of the topics that I wanted to touch bases on. Okay, use tax. I don't know the intricacies of how much percentage of the use tax our agency gets in return. I am under the impression that we do get a certain percentage of use tax assessments that we assess throughout the year. So this school year. I may be wrong. I'm just want to point that out. I also want to point out that we need to revisit um, the cargo inspection fee. Okay. As, um, I meant to discuss that earlier. The customs inspection fees are right now $5.00 at the cargo facility for anything under 100 pounds and anything thereafter is at a point zero zero one two proration. At the maritime section, it's uh, 4,000 pounds. Your first 4,000 pounds is a standard fee of $5. And that any, any pound at Thereafter is paraded at point zero zero one two. I also like to point out that our petroleum companies that bring fuel into Ireland are bringing fuel in the amounts of 
like eight million. I have assessed a few of these, and we have a cap of five hundred dollars. Cargo inspection fee. And this is just some of the ways I think we can improve identifying funds for agency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ordinance. Uh, any other questions you have anyone? Just last point. I, I, that's exactly the kind of recommendations, Director, I think would really help us. And I believe Center, we need to capitalize on those petroleum companies because they don't give us a discount on their fuel. Okay. Just so you know, both in Jess and on the record, by the way, thanks for the recommendation. The chair has already tasked me to work on the f bill and she wants it on her desk by Monday. Um, in all seriousness, um, I know that your team has also worked uh, with an uh, interagency working group on the need to standardize the import forms, right? I think especially uh, within the context of fisheries, but it can be applied for other commodities. And so I'd like to pick up that conversation with you folks and how we can do that if it's appropriate, uh, at least for this jurisdiction, to encourage our seat of my brothers and start there. Remember that uniform fisheries form when you declare it at the port because you have other countries that have forms that are inconsistent with other jurisdictions and so it makes it harder to record commercial fisheries data that comes in and, and it just messes the whole data collection process up so we can we can pick that up so that customs can be much more efficient uh, that, that concludes my test my, my follow-up questions and suggestions that I'm sure Great. thank you very much everyone for being here today uh, like I said previously I'd like to do one more informational hearing I'm glad Senator Castro is ready to get to work and write some bills for us um, and also, uh, thank you, Director, for, for coming here after your very important meeting. Uh, uh, it's very nice to always see your face and to always hear what you have to say and how we can better customs and quarantine. Um, if there's anything else, I'd like to adjourn this information hearing. Anything else? Okay. And I'll let the public know that, um, that we'll be having a meeting maybe sometime in June, another informational hearing. Yes, Major Perez? Um, just uh, one thing that maybe when we when we meet the next time is you mentioned um, greater autonomy for Guam Customs. Yes. And one of the things that we keep throwing out within our agency is that if we had greater autonomy, we would be able to hire and move things forward. As you're aware, with the current processes, with the, like the hiring process, Department of Administration and stratification of of applications, et cetera, et cetera, uh, scheduling testing and, and then interviews. Um, if we wanted to hire somebody today, today, it would take over a year before we even get to see anybody hit the field. So you can see how that exponentially impacts our capability to put any body or bodies out in the field. And a lot of times, even our own promotion system, um, if we're able to have greater autonomy, we would we would be able to have a greater impact for the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Major. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, for being here. Director, thank you. Uh, let me just read from our script, please. The Committee on Housing, Utilities, Public Safety, and Homeland Security is now adjourned. It is now 5.18 p.m. Have a good evening. Thank you, you guys.